You ready to go? Yeah. Okay. All right. Our folks are here. Oh Wait. my God. You guys, I am so excited to be here today um, to introduce some luminaries from the great Commonwealth of Massachusetts. People are saying, some people are saying it's the greatest state. Um, my name is Matt Rustica. Um, I am the director of market transformation at the Building Decarbonization Coalition, which puts me high in the running for the longest title in North America. Um, <laughs> Uh, Massachusetts is not just important because it's the place where I was born. Um, it's also important because we're um, in New England and in Massachusetts specifically making a ton of strides um, on building decarbonization um, policy and market development. Um, yeah. And so I'm here today uh, oh, to introduce yeah. some of the um, freaking you, yeah. Um, I'm here today to introduce some of the luminaries of uh, of thought leadership in Massachusetts on building decarbonization. Um, we'll get to that in a moment, but I'd like to introduce BDC first. If we could go to the next slide. Um, the Building Decarbonization Coalition is a is a relatively new organization. We're about five years old. Um, we're found we're founded to harness the power of coalition to forge paths toward building decarbonization in the U.S. Um, what this means uh, for us, uh, the the kind of insight that we come to this with, is the knowledge that there's a lot of support. Um, for the need to decarbonize buildings than you might understand by reading the news. Um, so at BDC, we bring together all the stakeholders across um, the supply chain, across the uh, NGO sphere, um, across all the folks that are interested in this uh, topic. Um, and we provide a venue where we can hash out the best ways forward, um, the, the ways that are going to decarbonize while also growing the environment, uh, growing the marketplace um, and creating jobs. Um, so you can visit buildingdecarb.org slash join, um, peruse our website, um, check out BDC. Uh, we'd love to have you. Next slide. Um, so for this webinar, um, we're going to start off with everyone muted. Um, I will uh, kind of monitor the chat. Um, so if you could ask your questions uh, via chat, um, we're going to ask each of the three speakers to respond to them at the end of remarks, and I'll, um, I'll kind of curate them from the chat. So if you could please... Um, uh, drop them in there for me. That'd be great. Um, we will record. In fact, we're already recording this webinar. Uh, we have a resource library on our website at buildingdecarb.org. Um, so you can check that out um, uh, for the recording after if you want to share with anybody or anything like that. Um, and as I said, buildingdecarb.org, um, sign up for a future policy call, sign up for our newsletter, all uh, resource library and all that stuff can be found there. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so as I said, you know, I, I'm I'm doing the introduction now. That's this is the introduction. Um, we're going to head uh, head on to panel presentations after this, um, and then we'll have some question and answer. Next slide, please. <clears throat> um, so I'm going to let each of these folks um, introduce themselves, but uh, these are really three um, leaders in the building decarbonization space, uh, not just in Massachusetts but nationally. We've got Paul Ormond um, from the Massachusetts Department of Energy Resources. Um, Paul is. Uh, really an expert in all things passive house and uh, building codes and and many more things besides. Um, ben, ben Butterworth, who's the director of climate energy and equity analysis at Acadia Center, which is a regional um, think tank in the Northeast, <clears throat> um, who's going to uh, do a little bit of uh, discussion about some of the clean heat standard discussions that are uh, going on in Massachusetts today. Um, and last but not least, Nikki Bruno, who is vice president of clean technologies at Eversource Energy which is a, a utility company with both gas and electric assets that serves uh, three states in New England, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and Connecticut. Um, so without any further ado, uh, we'll turn it over to Paul, who can introduce himself. Hi, everyone. How are you doing? Um, I, Matt, I, I just can, um, um, am I doing the intro and then we're doing all three intros, or am I doing intro and then my piece? I'm going to ask um, each participant to introduce themselves at the beginning of their presentation. So. You, you go ahead and introduce yourself. I'm sorry, and then and then go into my piece, or yeah, are the that's other? Right. Okay, great. Okay, great. Um, so let me uh, let me give. Can everyone hear me? Okay, I think Matt, you can hear me. Okay. Um, so my name's Paul. I work for the Department of Energy Resources here in the state of Massachusetts. We're the um, 
the the state energy office that's responsible for um, energy efficiency codes and standards. Um, so I have, I think, five or eight minutes or so. I don't have any slides. I thought I'd just make kind of a quick pitch. And the pitch I'd like to make is concerns kind of a big departure that we made with our um, with our stretch code. Um, so let me use this time to share what we did and what that departure is all about and why we did that. And as a spoiler alert, the reason that we made such a big departure with our stretch code is because we think that the way people have been using stretch codes has not been very effective from a decarbonization standpoint, and that the direction that we're going with our new stretch code is much more effective for decarbonization. Um, so you might be familiar with the concept of a stretch code. Um, many states have had them for the last decade or maybe even two decades or so. Um, they're intended to provide a means for a state to do something that ensures that buildings are doing all the best sort of energy efficiency measures and kind of pushing that edge a little bit. And the way that traditional stretch codes work is that a, uh, an energy efficiency standard baseline is established. Usually these are based on model codes. These are, you hear IECC, you hear ASHRAE. Those are the model codes. And um, the stretch code then says that your, your building must be built to those model codes. Um, plus your building has to be 10% less energy than it would otherwise have been to those model codes. So basically you have to beat the model codes energy use by some percent. It's typically 10%, it might be 20%. Um, and so if that sounds familiar with what you might have encountered with LEED, uh, what you might have encountered with um, utilities, um, uh, incentive structures, um, a lot of different standards, stretch codes, rating systems, and um, utility incentive structures have this structure. They say build to a certain level of code, beat that by some percent better on a total building energy use basis, and you know you you satisfy the stretch code, or you satisfy the lead points, or you satisfy the utility program. Um, so this approach has um, been, you know, pretty much the go-to approach for all these different standards and rating systems for a long time. And it's kind of taken over everything, right? So there is, however, a really epic disadvantage with this traditional stretch code approach. And let me just rip off the Band-Aid and explain what that disadvantage is. Um, this percent better approach doesn't really help you with decarbonization. Big secret revealed this afternoon. Um, in fact, the percent better approach used in stretch codes uh, can sometimes undermine your efforts to decarbonization. So let me explain why that is and then what you can do about it and a new direction for stretch codes. Um, so if your goal is to reduce total energy use in the buildings, then the old school stretch code approach percent better is all you need, right? So that's served us well, and it may continue to serve us going forward uh, if that's what you're trying to achieve is total energy use in buildings. Uh, but if your goal is building decarbonization, um, the problem with this old school stretch code approach is that not all BTUs are created equal. And so let me give you a, a stark example. Let's say that your stretch code requires me to be 20% better than a certain IECC baseline. That sounds very impressive, right? Um, but here's the problem. It's very easy for a design team to meet this kind of 20% better stretch code using efficiency measures like improving lighting, improving fan energy, plug loads, pump efficiency, all these kind of things. And we could meet that standard of 20% better and go like this and say we've meet our stretch code. But 
all of those things reduce the electricity use of a building. And none of them have reduced the gas or fossil fuel use of a building, uh, which is usually embodied in a building's space heating, and to some extent, the building's water heating. Um, so it's possible to actually, that's that's a bad scenario, right? If, you're, if your goal is decarbonization, you have a situation where there's really, there's not even an incentive built into things to, to reduce the fossil fuel use. Um, but it could actually get worse because it's possible to reduce all of that electricity use through lighting and those kind of improvements. And you can actually still achieve the 20% better or the 10% better, whatever that percent better is. And you can increase the fossil fuel use and still make that stretch code. We see it all the time. And that's because you can build a building with a poor envelope and not pay attention to the envelope in any way or have poor energy ventilation systems and make up for it with lighting and other efficiency measures like that. So you can actually increase the gas use of a building and still achieve those stretch codes. So that's why I say stretch codes can are you know decarbonization neutral and potentially can undermine decarbonization efforts. Um, so reducing electricity use is important. I don't want to say that that's not important, um, but it's just it's just not it's just one of two things that we have to do. And the second thing is that we have to reduce and we have to really eliminate fossil fuel use in buildings, um, particularly the fossil fuel use for space heating. So when it came time for us to update our um, stretch code, we decided to step away from this percent better approach and use a kind of decarbonization driven approach. Um, and what that decarbonization driven approach does is instead of mandating that your overall building energy use is reduced by a certain percent, what it does is it focuses on the part of the energy use of that building that is related to heating. And it says that it's actually, it's actually mandating that the heating demand be below certain limits. And there's also accompanying limits for cooling demand too. That's a, that's a you wanna do those at the same time. Um, so this way design teams can focus on energy efficiency measures that reduce heating demand and they're forced to without sort of lighting and pumps and other, these are distractions from decarbonization that we need to achieve. Um, and here's the good news of what we discovered. And we did research on this for about four years with a huge number of consultants and um, tons of research of what other states and other um, entities were doing and the success of Passive House. Um, it's possible to not just reduce space heating loads and make good progress there, it's possible in buildings to crush space heating loads to oblivion. And that means that most commercial buildings, including multifamily buildings, if you use a space heating load reduction mindset when you design your building, you may end up with buildings that have almost no space heating, even here in climate zone Boston, Massachusetts, where it's cold, right? So how do we do that? Quality envelope, very low air infiltration, thermal bridge mitigation, and high level of energy recovery, ventilation energy recovery. Um, that's the combination. It's kind of a simple combination that delivers very uh, low heating demands. Um, these heating demands can be reduced by 60, sometimes 90% than even our last stretch code that we just replaced. So once that heating demand is crushed to oblivion, it becomes very easy to electrify that space heating and swap from gas space heating to electric heat pumps. And, um, and here's one of the most important aspects of this uh, new stretch code that we developed too. We found that for almost all building types, when you swap from gas space heating to electric space heating, if you reduce the space heating and crush it to oblivion, as the stretch code banks you do now, you can make that swap without necessarily increasing your electric peak demand. So this whole nonsense of, gosh, if we go to heat pumps, we're gonna break our grid, 
can be avoided if we build our new buildings with focused on low heating energy delivery, like our new stretch code does. Um, other benefits of this, much more comfortable buildings to live in and much more resilient buildings to live in. These buildings will not get hot or cold uh, during power outages because they retain their ambient interior space heating so well. Um, so that's a quick update on our stretch code um, and the big departure that we made from traditional approach to stretch code. If anyone wants to learn more, please reach out to me. I'm on LinkedIn or you can reach me through, uh, through Matt. Um, but I look forward to hearing the other presentations and your questions at the end. Okay. Um, our, I think we're gonna um, we're gonna head through uh, Ben's presentation and Nikki's presentation, and then we will have um, some questions from the chat at the end. So I'll just like to remind you again: if you have questions for anybody, um, drop them in the chat. And Ben, take it away. Great. Thanks, Matt. Um, so yeah, my name is Ben Butterworth. I'm the Director of Climate, Energy, and Equity Analysis for Acadia Center. Um, and I work on a bunch of different energy policy topics uh, across the Northeast. Um, and I took the opposite approach of Paul, um, and I have a bunch of slides, so I'm going to run through them pretty quickly. Um, so yeah, who is Acadia Center? Acadia Center's mission is to advance bold, effective, and equitable clean energy solutions for a livable climate and a stronger, more equitable economy. Next slide. Great, so just some kind of clean heat standard 101 basics. Um, a clean heat standard is a performance standard requiring heating energy providers to replace fossil fuel heating with clean heat over time. And there's kind of two main options there for doing that. Uh, you can implement clean heat measures themselves, for example, installing a heat pump, or you can purchase credits. And so who are the heating energy providers that are potentially covered by a clean heat standard, um, also referred to as the obligated party? Uh, natural gas utilities, delivered fuel providers, so that'd be fuel oil or propane, and then there's some debate over whether electric utilities should be included or not. Uh, I don't think they should. I can talk about that a little bit later in the presentation. Next slide. Um, so yeah, it requires a gradually increasing percent of low emission heating services to customers over time. And the goal is there to be at the same pace um, that's necessary to comply with the state level greenhouse gas reduction targets established in law. Um, we'll touch on what those are for Massachusetts a bit later. Um, so there, and the credits are allocated based on the tons of GHG reduced, right? Because the primary goal of the policy here is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the building sector. Um, and you'll note that there's some similarities to an RPS um, in the electricity generation sector, which obviously a lot of states have. Um, but one of the key differences here is that power generation is a lot more centralized than building heating, right? Um, it doesn't require interventions on a household by household. Um, and just quickly noting that, you know, there's a couple other similar, similar policies in other states um, that are relevant here. I didn't include them on the slide, but, um, you know, the, the, some of the West Coast states have had, a, including California, have had a low carbon fuel standard for years. Um, and that's focused on the transportation sector, but kind of a similar policy. Um, some similarities to a, a clean heating standard is that, you know, electricity is considered a, a credible resource in those programs. So for example, EV drivers in California generate credits um, for the low carbon fuel standard program. Um, and the California program also does life cycle accounting of fuels, which is particularly relevant when you're talking about biofuels as a potentially eligible measure. Um, and then there's a couple other states um, that have clean heat standards, most notably Vermont and Colorado. Um, Vermont passed the Affordable Heat Act in May of 2023, and Colorado uh, passed the bill in 2021 establishing a clean heat standard. So I won't get into details on those states, but just note this isn't the first state in the country to, uh, to jump into the clean heat standard. Next slide. Um, yeah, so I just thought I'd provide uh, a visual here. I'm not going to read through this, but these are just kind of CHA state clean heat standard basics kind of just broken out into a visual format and also i'd like to just thank the regulatory assistance project who's done a lot of great work um providing kind of thought leadership and educational materials on the clean heat standard um i went ahead and borrowed a few other visuals for this presentation because i didn't see the need to uh, reinvent the wheel next slide 
So I think one of the key kind of um, discussion points in the design of clean heat standard is, you know, what is going to be considered a clean heat measure? Um, and not only what will be a clean heat measure, but how will you actually measure the greenhouse gas emissions avoided from that measure? So both these questions are kind of core to the entire program. Um, and I kind of split out, you know, clean heat measures into these three separate buckets. Um, and I would say this is kind of a categorization based on the comments that Massachusetts DEP has received about the Massachusetts clean heat standard to date. Um, so, you know, in a minimal debate kind of bucket where there's general agreement, it seems, um, things like heat pumps um, and energy efficiency improvements to buildings. Um, I put hybrid heating arrangements in the moderate debate uh, category just because there's going to be challenges with how you actually measure the GHG emissions avoided from hybrid systems because uh, end users can use hybrid systems very differently depending on the end user. Um, and then the high debate category um, gets into some of the alternative fuels like renewable natural gas, um, biodiesel, hydrogen, synthetic fuels, um, things like that. Uh, next slide. So why does Massachusetts actually need a clean heat standard? Um, so the Global Warming Solutions Act requires economy-wide net zero emissions by 2050 and 50% below 1990 levels by 2030. And then there's uh, sector level targets as well in Massachusetts. So you'll note that the building sector uh, heating is, is just slightly different, 49% below 1990 levels by 2030. But obviously that's a significant decrease in a pretty short period of time. Um, and to date, state energy efficiency programs um, have been one of the key drivers of building sector decarbonization. However, alone is just not going, going to be enough. Um, and also kind of the structure of the energy efficiency programs, both in Massachusetts and other states is high re highly reliant on this per kilowatt hour charge on consumers electricity bill as sort of the primary funding mechanism for the program. Um, and answering my own question on the slide, is that sustainable? I would say no. And one of the core goals of the clean heat standard is really to spread the costs of the building energy transition to natural gas, propane and heating oil customers. The current system for funding energy efficiency is particularly disadvantaged for electric heating customers. Um, so those customers use more electricity, thus, thus pay more uh, on a per kilowatt hour basis um, into funding state energy efficiency programs because of how our funding system is designed. Next slide. Yeah, so the, for those less familiar with Massachusetts um, residential heating fuels, there's a really a high reliance on distributed fuels in Massachusetts and in the Northeast generally, um, particularly heating oil in Massachusetts. Um, several states in New England have even higher reliance on delivered fuels. So that's worth keeping in mind just because it's important in this region to design a clean heat standard that goes beyond focusing on just the gas distribution system and really tackles delivered fuels as well. Next slide. Uh, so I titled this slide, How Fast is Faster? Um, and the answer is that faster is really, really fast. Um, the, this table is from the Massachusetts Clean Energy and Climate Plan for 2025 and 2030. Um, and as you can see in the building sector, Massachusetts has had a 4% reduction in emissions in the last 10 years, that being 2010 to 2020. And we need about a 36% reduction in building sector emissions in the next 10 years, that is 2020 to 2030. So we have to move a lot faster. Next slide. Um, and I borrowed this visual from RAP. Um, so thank you again to them. Um, but what about the other policy options? And I think this did a kind of good job of, of keeping it simple as to why a clean heat standard might be necessary. Um, so incentives alone, not strong enough. So the Massachusetts Energy Efficiency Program has done a lot of great things, but very challenging to fund energy efficiency and electrification at the scale we need by primarily relying just on electric ratepayer per kil kilowatt hour surcharges. Public funding and taxes um, tend to not be reliable enough. So you can think of policies like a carbon tax or cap and trade that are obviously very challenging politically. Um, building codes and bans. Um, so Paul just discussed building codes. Uh, we should definitely be doing this. And, and Massachusetts, as Paul pointed out, is making great strides in this arena. 
Um, but the housing stock in Massachusetts is old and most of the buildings that currently exist today will also exist in 2050. So it's imperative that we have policies that really aggressively tackle emissions in the existing building stock. Next slide. So the Massachusetts process, where are we at right now? I just wanted to run through kind of the timeline quickly, just so folks are aware. Um, in June of last year, the CECP for 2025 and 2030 tasked the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection or MassDEP with developing a CHS. Um, there was also a Clean Heat Commission that released their report in November of last year's, and they kind of re-emphasized the need for DEP to take the lead on the development of a clean heating standard or similar policy. Um, in March 2023, DEP released a discussion document um, that was primarily a series of questions for stakeholders to respond to. Um, Kitty responded to those questions in length with some of our coalition partners. Um, getting into some of the nuts and bolts of how we saw a CHS unfolding. And then in June and July, these past couple months, um, DEP has hosted a number of virtual community meetings and technical sessions. Um, and as far as the process goes, I think my one comment would be that um, to date, the technical sessions have really taken the form of sort of a listening approach, and that's a very intentional by Mass DEP. Um, and that's a fine approach, but I would also just emphasize the need um, for real interactive technical stakeholder engagement on the nuts and the bolts of the policy. Um, really once there's a straw proposal for stakeholders to react to. Um, so that has not yet come, but we're hopeful that that will come later in the CHS development process. Next slide. Um, and I want to talk a bit about coordination with gas system planning. Um, I was very involved in the Massachusetts 2080 Future of Gas process, and there's a lot of connections to the clean heating standard. Um, so I think one core challenge of uh, the CHS, and it's not the only core challenge, but it's one is Massachusetts does not have a comprehensive plan for the future of the gas system over the next three decades. Um, so DPU 2080 or the Future of Gas docket attempted to create that vision. Um, the investigation was opened in the fall of 2020. Um, consultants and the LDC, the gas utilities, released final reports in March of 2022. Um, and I won't get into the details here, happy to talk about in Q&A with significant concerns among environmental advocates with a modeling approach and assumptions. And to date, DPU has not issued a ruling um, and it's still pending as of August, 2023. Next slide. So yeah, coordination with the gas system planning, I think it's really important because there's an important distinction between uh, kind of bucket one, which is near-term strategies that result in marginal reduction in emissions, and kind of bucket two, which is long-term strategies that support the least cost pathway to net zero by 2050. Um, and it can be challenging to distinguish between number one and number two above without clear vision for the gas system. Um, so one example, just to like kind of illustrate that is, you know, blending of RNG into the gas distribution system may provide some near-term GHG reductions, but what is the end game for full decarbonization of the gas system, given some of the challenges posed with limited supplies of RNG and hydrogen and some of the technical blending limitations? Um, so it depends really how you're thinking about the kind of near-term versus long-term strategies, and that's really critical to designing a CHS, and that's why having a long-term vision for the gas distribution system is really critical. Um, so ideally a CHS would complement strategic geographically targeted decommissioning of the gas distribution system in a least cost equitable manner. Next slide. And so how do you make an equitable CHS? I mean, this is really one of the primary core questions for the CHS development in Massachusetts. Um, we know that disadvantaged communities are disproportionately live in older housing with inefficient shells and higher heating burdens. Um, and firstly, these communities must be involved in the design of the program. That's absolutely essential. And then there's many options for ensuring an equitable um, CHS design. Um, so concepts like a just transition fee where projects that don't support equitable outcomes are um, required to pay this just transition fee. Um, which would be used to deploy um, clean heating solutions in disadvantaged communities. Um, you could think of carve out requirements for disadvantaged communities. You know, X percent of projects must be focused on disadvantaged communities. Um, and then you can also think of higher program incentives for um, equitable projects targeted at these disadvantaged communities. So there's a number of solutions. And I think 
um, the stakeholder process over the next few months, we'll kind of hash out the pros and cons um, of these potential solutions more, uh, uh, more thoroughly. And then coordination with policy solutions outside the scope of the CHS is also going to be essential. Um, and I just flagged rate reform as one um, potential policy change that's really outside the scope of the CHS. But when you're thinking about equitable transition in the building sector, um, really essential to consider. Next slide. Um, and I'm not going to get into all these topics, but I just want to flag that, you know, the, the deeper I dive into the clean heat standard, the, the more complicated <laughs> I realize it is. Um, and so the CHS can get complicated. Um, Complications related to measure verification, um, compliance flexibility, and banking of credits, um, determining the appropriate level of alternative compliance payment levels, um, biofuels lifecycle GHG accounting, um, hybrid heat system crediting, like I discussed a bit earlier, and coordination with uh, existing programs is um, particularly complicated, especially when you think of the existing mass safe program and how can we design a completely separate program that's also complementing um, the existing work that MassSave is already doing. Um, so yeah, next steps in the process. Um, there's not like a clearly defined timeline here. Um, like I said, DEP held a number of stakeholder sessions in the last couple of months, um, but we will be continuing to track it and see how the process evolves. Um, and yeah, thank you for your time. Uh, this is my contact information, so feel free to reach out. And thanks. All right. <clears throat> Wonderful. Thank you, Ben. Thank you so much. Um, any questions for Ben? Uh, please put them in the chat. I know I have a million questions for Ben, and I'm constantly texting Ben with millions of questions. So um, don't worry. He's used to it. Um, uh, next, we have Nikki Bruno. We're super excited to have Nikki here. Um, Nikki's going to talk about uh, something that may or may not be familiar to all of you now, but most certainly will be familiar to all of you soon, um, which is uh, Eversource's Framingham Thermal Energy Network, Network Geothermal Pilot. Um, so I'll turn it over to Nikki. Thanks, Matt, and uh, thank you everyone for having me today. Uh, excited to see some familiar names in the in the chat and, and like both the speakers before me, happy to take any questions. Um, I'll try to keep time here. So next slide, please. So I wanted to talk about um, our Network Geothermal Pilot in Framingham in Massachusetts. And, and you know, when, when Matt kind of did the opener on putting Massachusetts on the map or keeping us on the map. I know we're always trying to be thought leaders and appreciated the LinkedIn post about basketball because I grew up in Springfield. Um, but, you know, I, I think the Framingham experience, I'll call it, has just been really awesome all the way around. And, and hopefully by the end of this, you know, we can see about ways to work differently together um, from all different sides of the aisle or across the table kind of thing um, to get something done quickly. Um, if there's one theme I think we'll leave today with, there's, there's not a lot of time um, and we have to make really great strides in emissions reductions pretty quickly. Um, so we need to take advantage of anything and everything and where we can find common ground. That'll be a theme that I'll, I'll kind of harp on throughout. So, but this is just a little bit about the project itself. So we actually received approval to pursue this pilot project. Uh, at the time, we didn't know where exactly, except that it would be in the NSTAR gas territory. So, you know, Eastern and Southeastern Massachusetts, um, because we filed this as part of our rate case there. This was pre-COVID. Um, you know, we received approval in late 2020, so we were in the middle of COVID. Um, and, you know, right from the get-go, I, I know there are folks from HEAT on the phone. Um, there are a lot of folks involved with the narrative and garnering support around doing this as an innovation project. Um, and I think as people started thinking about, geez, well, you know, we've got to think about electrification. Um, are there more efficient ways than perhaps air source heat pumps? Brown source heat pumps have been around for a while, but just the concept of networking it hasn't been done quite yet, um, or at least by a utility, I should say, at that point. And you know, heat was really instrumental in I think getting that that study with Barrow Happel done, um, and also getting the word out. And this predates me at Eversource, so uh, happy to take questions and field what I can on that. But that was the beginning, and we actually put this in as part of a series of three geothermal opportunities, um, really chasing delivered fuels because. Um, ben showed the chart. There's still quite a bit of folks in New England and, and in Massachusetts that have oil or propane. Um, 
And you know that's that's kind of the low-hanging fruit in terms of emissions reductions and cost savings. Um, you know, we were trying to pull data from Mass CEC on existing ground source heat pump installations and use what we could to kind of show those economic benefits as much as cost to install. So we came in with three. One site or one set of um, parameters was approved, and that was to install a network system with mixed load in a dense urban environment within our gas service territory. Um, so we began really in 2021. Um, and again, under COVID, so all virtual working through, we had about a total of 17 sites, um, you know, trying to vet through which ones would be really an ideal spot to locate our first step out. And again, even the site selection, we were writing the rule book. Um, I, I have to be honest, uh, I am not a geothermal expert by any stretch. I've learned a lot. Um, but, you know, a lot of us haven't done exactly this before. And so you're piecing together your, um, your skill set. You're trying to move forward and, and learn as much as possible. Um, and, you know, we got these sites that they came into us in all sorts of fashions. Um, and we had a lot of folks at the table. So it wasn't just the utility talking to the DPW or, you know, one anchor customer. It was NGOs at the table. It was the sustainability coordinators in the city. Um, you know, heat sat just about at every one of those meetings with us, um, customers, housing authorities, et cetera. So it was a really cross-functional effort from the get-go. And I think that made a lot of the follow-on steps a lot quicker and more efficient to get through. So um, even if you don't enjoy the feel-good story about that, there's some business efficiencies there. So we were able to identify the Framingham site after we set up these screening criteria. We did three gates of how are we going to select a site. And we based it a lot on our DP order. Certainly we had some parameters we had to achieve, but we made a lot of things, mandates. Um, we incorporated qualitative components, not just technical components. So the host community, we wanted, you know, we needed to have support because we knew from our gas and electric execution, you know, you're going to get those same permits for digging up the street or, or hanging wires off the poles, you know, all of those normal kind of construction um, elements. We knew we'd have to work with wherever we were, whatever city we were in. Um, so the host support was really important to us. Um, we mandated having this located in um, an environmental justice community and having low-income um, customers as part of the network. Uh, with all the talk about equity, um, you know, the utilities are, are in, a, a, I think, a unique spot. We have to serve all. Um, we have a lot of deep ties with low-income customers and organizations, and so we just felt that was the right thing to do, um, to bring this clean energy option to folks that perhaps may not have otherwise received it. And, you know, geothermal sometimes can be thought of as an affluent solution. If it was a single install, you have to pay quite a bit of money to install this, perhaps at your home, you know, the drilling, um, you know, some, par some parts of of uh, the actual system. So for us to do this, we kind of were able to level the playing field and offer to folks maybe who couldn't otherwise pay for it. Um, what it netted out to be, um, it's about a mile, a uh, square mile here, and it's in green on the graphic. Um, and we have all sorts of customers on this loop. So 37 buildings, 132 cu individual customers, but we have single family, duplexes, apartment buildings, small businesses, local to Framingham. Um, everything is retrofit. So it'll be a great sample set on if there's, not that new new construction is easy by any stretch, but retrofit I would argue is harder to, to do. And so we'll have some great data on the costs as we're working through the install and operation of the system. And we have about 90 boreholes. And, and I'll talk a little bit about, I have some pictures up coming on, on that. Um, and what's different in this system is, you know, we have pipe that we're laying in the streets. Similar to gas distribution pipe, it's actually the same material. We're gonna be running a water and glycol based fluid through it. So you can just run straight water as well. Um, but so instead of methane, we're running water. Um, and in addition to that, there's the service lines that go into the building. Again, kind of traditional for us as the utility, we install those all the time. What's gonna be unique are two, two other components. One, it's gonna be a ground source heat pump that we're gonna um, install for the buildings. And two, we have bores. So about 500 to 600 feet deep vertical loop that we're gonna be drilling. Um, and the way it just worked out with the, the, um, the geography here and kind of the customer base is we actually have them going into fields. So three separate locations um, around the network. Uh, we also have the ability to um, 
you know, uh, put them in the rights of way. So as the as the utility here, the gas utility, we have franchise rights. And I think that was some of the, um, why the gas utility, why are you guys doing this? Um, because, you know, we can, we can access the public rights of way. We're used to this type of construction where you manage long lived assets all the time. Um, and, you know, we have that managed oversight of electric and gas grids. So it, it made sense for us to offer this to customers. Uh, it's just a different type of energy. Um, so that's a, a summary of the project in short. Um, and I'll go to the next slide, please. So construction started, and this is a picture of one of the drill rigs, uh, which I'll talk about in one sec. But construction really started in June. We had a great kickoff um, in, with the community and, and with some key stakeholders. And uh, you know we're on a pretty condensed schedule. So we have a couple different work streams going. The pipes being laid right now, it's over 50% done and installed in the, in the road. Um, we're, we're gonna be, we started the drilling, um, you know, we're, we're going to be ramping that up through the early uh, early fall, um, and then we're also going to be starting in early fall, really the customer conversion, so the in building work, um, all with the inclination to bring this online, heating season timeline, or end of the year. Um, so it's a lot of work to be done, certainly. And as everybody knows, we've gotten quite a bit of rain. So, you know, we did test wells back last fall and it was a little bit drier then, but these are all the normal bumps and bruises with construction that we're working on. So um, this rig in particular, I wanted to just point out because um, we do have a couple drillers subcontracted to our main construction contractor installing the project. But um, this technology from Celsius is really exciting because um, you know, it's it's not the traditional vertical bores. They're actually being drilled in a diagonal fashion. Uh, it's an innovative solution to drilling. It takes up a much smaller footprint. Um, and Celsius, uh, they're they're affiliated with Schlumberger, which is known throughout the world globally for their for their drilling capabilities, but they also for their data analytics. So we're going to have unique ability to to kind of see how the bores are performing. Um, and you know we have to install less of them because of this technology. So that's that's really really exciting. We're we're happy to have them on the team as as all our vendors. And you know just a, a quick look. I mean we talk about building codes, clean heat standards, effectuating decarbonization. Um, this team throughout feasibility all the way to construction and beyond is showing that there's a vendor ecosystem that goes with these types of projects. We need to build that up as well. And it's it's workforce certainly, but even in those third party consultant support roles, um, no team that I'm aware of yet <laughs> has the ability to do all of this and has you know SMEs across the board, subject matter experts across the board. It's a mashup. And you know, we found that you know the geothermal industry had a lot of smaller firms that were used to doing soup to nuts for say a singular building type setup, not this network setup. Um, or you had those large engineering firms where maybe they had one geothermal expert on the staff, but they could check that box. But really they were more suited to different types of engineering and construction type work. So we had, you know, the behind the veil work that we had to do from procurement, um, evaluating the contractors and, and understanding the technology on that side was was building building our book, if you will, as much as, you know, all of the stakeholder work we've done, all of the understanding of the actual technology and, and kind of getting the word out there. And so with that, I'll go to the next slide um, because I'd be totally remiss if I didn't talk about the community and the stakeholder piece. and really wanted to keep that equity thread front and center because, um, you know, certainly in my, I guess I didn't really do a good job introducing myself, but, you know, I'm responsible for all the decarbonization work on the gas side at Eversource. I also have um, responsibility for all of the customer side on the gas side. So it's it's been this interesting marriage, and, and this is in the last year, um, but what it's netted is, you know, we talk about um, putting customer first and that customers do in fact drive this adoption. And so we're always trying to think of ways, how can we get customers to find decarbonized options um, that they that fits their needs, whether they're residential, whether they're large commercial and industrial, you know, to be a little technology agnostic is important if we get the emissions reductions. That's the key. Um, so geothermal, we actually had our uh, formerly known as gas sales and marketing. We've now renamed ourselves customer thermal solutions. We had them go out and sell this project to the customers in the neighborhood. Um, and they went out over a weekend, knocked on doors. They had prepared packets of information. We had made a video for folks. Um, we had made sure we had translators available because this is an EJ community for language. So Portuguese is actually the top language in the neighborhood. 
And what we received in, in interest over a weekend was more than we might have, say, on a traditional gas expansion um, or you know conversion type project over a couple of months. So it was very, very encouraging. Um, what's exciting too, I mean, obviously a lot is free. We are covering the cost of the network, the drilling, um, even the customer equipment, which is unique for the utility, I, I realized after shortly coming here. Um, but the DPU allowed us to cover that cost. Um, and I think it's great because it indemnifies the customer a bit. You know, it allows us to take, to bear that risk. And, you know, what we've told them from day one is uh, one of our main communications has been, we're not going to be perfect. This is our first go. Uh, technology has been there. It's been out there. Don't don't worry about that. And we are your utility. We'll make sure you have the heat you need, etc. But you know there will be some learning curves here, and and I think that's worked really well. And and the customer base has been unbelievable. The city has been unbelievable. Um, you know we had a town hall, and that's the top picture there, just dedicated for the residents along the prospective loops, and they were just. Uh, asking really deep technical questions. And we took that as a compliment. We were initially surprised, but we took that as a compliment because they really sunk into the materials and were taking a lot of the outreach seriously. Um, and they wanted to be educated about this. It's their home um, and, and I get it. And, and that was a really great compliment. And since that, the journey has been uh, really amazing. And, and you know, I think it's strengthened a lot of relationships, both in the NGO community, climate advocate community, because you know, it's it's easy to talk about things, um, and but it's another thing to do it to actually put something into the ground or install something to help further the cause, and and that's you know we we want to be part of that. You know, we think our skill set at the utility certainly lies in execution, um, and and that's why this project is so important to us. We also think you know other utilities across the country have picked this up um, and now have proposed their own pilots. So we're part of a, co a collaborative with utilities that we just get to chat together, talk about lessons learned. You know what are you doing? What legislation's out there? You know what are you doing with your regulators to make these? Um, even what are you doing internally to get these sorts of things approved? Um, so we like to think of ourselves as thought leaders from a utility uh, perspective. And um, you know, mandating this equity and environmental justice approach, meeting folks where they are, whether it's translation, media, um, you know, availability like virtually or otherwise, or even you know having meetings at certain times, it feels like little things, but all things that give accessibility to folks where maybe they otherwise may not have been involved is really important, and that's going to be our template going forward. Um, you know. People have varied opinions about the utility. I've heard them quite a bit because I spearheaded the future of gas proceeding. And, and you know, um, as, as a person who's been, who was born also in the Commonwealth and, and raised here and cares very deeply about the community I live in, um, you know, sometimes it's, it's hard to take. And when you feel like you're being excluded from your opinion being heard, I, I get that. Um, and, you know, I feel like I've had a lot of opportunity not to be excluded. So we wanna make sure that folks feel like they're valued, especially because likely there's some sort of customer of ours and they're gonna be the ones driving this adoption. So we're excited about the engagement we've had. Um, and, you know, it just, because I see a lot of familiar faces on this call, you know, the, like I said, the, cl the climate advocacy piece that I wanted to mention for us is that we can work together and move quicker. And we found a lot of great common ground here to the point where I think we're, helping each other. We're augmenting research and data um, through this pilot, you know, and just quickly Mass EC had a grant out there that actually heat one and they've assembled a research team to augment our third party evaluation that we received money for under our DPU order, our, our, which is Department of Public Utilities. I apologize if I didn't spell that out. Um, but, you know, it's just, it's just a nice way to say, how do we make this a reality? Because our end goal for the pilot is really to find a fiscally responsible, environmentally beneficial way to offer customers a service they want and a service we think they need. Um, and it perpetuates all the decarbonization efforts of both our company and the state. Um, so we want to not stay in pilot phase long, but we are waiting on the data to make sure that we've got everything, you know, we've done our prudency review, if you will, but we do, you know, um, I'm happy to answer questions and I'll close with this. We expect the technology to work. We're, we're confident in that. Um, you know, it's really cost. I want to, we want to see how much this costs and how we can get those costs if they're higher down with economies of scale, et cetera. So very excited to, to be right in the thick of construction within service on the horizon. Um, and then we'll move into um, operations and maintenance mode with, for two cooling seasons um, and, uh, and, and go from there. But like I said, we're very optimistic about the future and about offering this as a complement to all of the uh, decarbonization efforts out there. Thank you. 
my goodness. I, I learn something new every time I talk to you guys. Thank you all so much again. Um, I'm going to kick off the Q and a here. There's been a bunch of questions in the chat that my colleague Kristen is going to um, walk through. I'm going to kick it off with a general question for each of you, for all of you, um, which is you've all made such big strides thinking through some of this transformative policy work. Um, what do you know now that you wish you had known when you started? Don't all jump to the... <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll go first. Um, I feel like we should have been where we are now, like four years ago. Um, and with the, the underlying stuff I described, you know, having a code that's focused on, um, on crushing heating load. Um, so we can, so we can really eliminate fossil fuels from buildings, et cetera. Um, we, you know, we kind of knew the science in um, this direction, directionally, um, and I wish we worked started earlier on it um, than we did. Uh, it just takes a long time to develop code, as you know. So, but I, I wish that's kind of the one thing I I think um, I knew. I wish I knew earlier, and so to make up for that, doing everything I can to try to spread the the uh, the gospel of crushing heating load and trying to to have everyone rethink uh, percent better stretch code approaches that kind of have taken over our world. <clears throat> so here I am. Gonna the give you guys a break. slide list presentation. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Nikki. <laughs> I was gonna give you guys a break from my voice. Sorry, um, but you know, I guess what I what I learned is you know there's. There's a lot of value in listening, um, in in talking this through because I, I remember even doing. I mean, this is this is how dated I guess it probably is, but I remember doing an environmental science degree where they where folks still had to talk about climate change and whether it was real or not, but kind of what the implications were, um, and obviously lean towards the latter, of course. But um, you know, just listening because there's a lot of fear and and it's such a big issue to tackle that some days it can seem unsurmountable. Um, and so I think kind of acknowledging that everybody wants to get to a good end state is important. Um, and, and just hearing people out because there's a lot of great ideas. And I'm just seeing in the chat, I mean, there's so many different ways to go and ask and riff off of everything we are just talking about even here um, that we, we need all of that to get to the end state. Um, and so the listening has been really important, I think, for, for me. And, and then on, and just to complement it, an education because, I mean, I've, I'm primarily from a gas background um, and I've had to learn how to speak electric. So there's a fluency element there. Um, and, and I think it benefits everybody, right? Um, so there's, there's an educational component that's really very important here. Yeah, no, I would just echo what Paul said. I mean, I wish I'd started working on this stuff earlier. I think the clean heat standard in particular, you know, it'd be great if we were talking about this uh, back in 2015. Um, you know, it strikes me as a policy that is both politically palatable and impactful in terms of building sector decarbonization, decarbonization simultaneously. Um, and we can see the writing on the wall for years now that you know funding energy efficiency and electrification, um, primarily the uh, surcharges on electricity bills wasn't really a sustainable um, business model for the type of decarbonization we need in the building sector. So um, I'm glad it's happening now. Wish it, wish it was happening uh, eight years ago and I was working directly on it. Thanks. And I know we just have six more minutes left, so I'll see if I can kind of bundle a couple of these questions for each of you in the chat. Um, Paul, there are some questions about the stretch code and what to do about existing buildings. Yeah, uh, let me just take one minute to talk about existing buildings. Um, so another new departure from our past stretch code is that our new stretch code also covers existing buildings. The, the old stretch code did not do that. And it also, it also covers all building sizes. The old stretch code used to apply to only buildings 100,000 square feet or greater. So, um, so those are two really big improvements. So if you do an existing building and you're renovating the, the windows, you have to bring that up to um, the better stretch code standards. If you're renovating the ventilation energy, the ventilation system, you have to have ventilation energy recovery. So all of those kind of 
elements that make the new stretch code work well um, apply to existing buildings when you do them. And I'll say just one more thing. We are also looking at, we're, we're beginning to undertake a uh, an evaluation of, um, is there some sort of existing building code we can create or guidelines that could um, better address sp some specific situations in renovations that are not well addressed with the way that the existing building code currently reads. So we're going to we're going to be getting into that in the coming year. So watch that space. Thanks, Paul. And then Ben, um, a comment and a question. So another uh, clean heat standard challenge flag was how to make various geographically distributed credit mechanisms visible to community plans and progress tracking. So I don't know if you want to comment on that. And then also a question about the similarities and differences with RPS, especially around some of the design and implementation challenges you laid out. Yeah, thanks. And, and I knew I could count on Mike Steinoff for a city level question. But yeah, I mean, I think overall the CHS, it's going to be entirely kind of new stream of reporting um, on a number of metrics, what's actually going on where. Um, equity metrics, hybrid heating metrics, how are hybrid systems actually being used? And and yeah, obviously having that reporting um, both on a state level scale and a, a city scale will be critically important for cities that also have ambitious kind of climate targets of their own. And, you know, cities also play a critical role in kind of getting the word out and um, as marketing mechanism for, for clean heat measure installation. So um, yeah, I agree they played a critical role and, and getting them good data will be um, essential. Um, in terms of, you know, RPS and CHS similarities, you know, I, I'm not an RPS expert, but I would say, you know, RPS is kind of the most widely known um, example of clean energy performance standards. Um, and at their core, CHS and RPS, you know, it's really replaced GHE intensive resources with clean resources. One's just, you know, focused on the power generation side and one's focused on the, the building side. Um, you know, both have a kind of like a ramp up over time and overall level of aggressiveness. Um, and sort of when you get into the nuts and bolts of design, you know, it's going to vary across state, you know, what's the list of eligible resources, you know, for RPS, you know, large hydro accounts in some states, doesn't count in others. Um, you could say the same about, you know, for example, RNG for a clean heat standard, um, maybe eligible in one state, maybe not eligible in the other. Um, another example will be, you know, carve outs, you know, some RPS policies have, have carve outs for solar, um, you could see kind of a similar uh, mechanism in the clean heat standard. Is there a is there a specific carve out for you know air source heat pumps or ground source heat pumps? You know X percent of total credits must be um, achieved via this measure or that measure. Um, so you can see kind of like some overlapping kind of similarities in, in overall um, design that people look at. Thanks, Ben. And then a quick one for Nikki. Both a comment and a question about construction. So a request. If Eversource had a first cut screening criteria for technical requirements to look for, such as building density, et cetera, to help other communities trying to identify pilots. And then a question about how the community is responding to construction. You're saving me some typing. I got um, Amanda's and I, Mike's I was just responding to. So I wrote a bunch in the chat around the community engagement. Um, we've been in the mindset of like over communicate and give folks too much information, but they've been very responsive and supportive. And like I said, we're, we're rolling into the usual construction, like you're gonna hear noise on X street for this amount of time. So they're dealing with the realities of it and it's been really great, very quiet. Um, you know, we're trying to make make it so that the city has no surprises, the customers have no surprises in the community as well. Um, so that's been going really well. And there's details in the chat on that. Um, you know, from uh, what's our kind of list of criteria, I would, I would, um, we're trying to keep a backlog. I know heat is, is assisting as well. We're just trying to compile which communities are very engaged and excited about having a network because, or a series of networks, because that's, that's a big factor and that's not really a technical one. Um, you know, I think you can really install these systems anywhere. It's just a matter of, uh, of cost in some cases, some there's some technical factors that are more suitable and in density, but really this is an energy efficiency play. So, you know, the low diversity is important. Um, you know, right now we're, we're doing this as a gas franchise. So, you know, where we have our gas territory, I know National Grid is also doing pilots as well. So 
both the main providers are eager to do this and others are picking it up. Um, and then, you know, we can definitely get something like that out. It's on our DPU website as well, our first cut at what that criteria looks like, and I'll drop that into the chat. Um, but we've been we've been trying to focus on EJ communities, and like I said about equity, uh, it's not certainly not a mandate if there are other communities that want this, but you know we want to make sure that we're including those types of you know uh, customers um, in our planning uh, for future networks as this builds out. All right, folks, we're at time. Thank you again so much, Nikki, Paul, and Ben. Um, this has been edifying as we expected it to be when you said you would do it. Um, so thank you so much uh, once more. Remember everyone, buildingdecarb.org, everything you might need about building decarbonization. Um, and feel free to reach out with any questions. Thank you.